Hi, everyone. Hi. Yay, this is so exciting. Cool. I am looking forward to this uh, conversation. Uh, so my name is Chrissy Sarah, and I live in North Chicago. I'm a senior sales support engineer for Sony Electronics Pro B division. And as you can imagine, Sony is pretty huge. So I'm going to give you an, an idea really quick of where our department lands in the scope of Sony family. And then we'll dive into today's topic, which is going to be network cameras and PTZ auto tracking and all that fun stuff. So um, first of all, I am with a, comp or a department called B2B, which means I work with our direct Sony manufacturer and sell to businesses and then businesses sell to their customers. So I like to say that I'm behind behind the scenes. I worked in broadcast engineering when I was in school and I started in broadcast production. So a little bit of my background starts from actual TV. I worked in Chicago for a while. I did news in Rockford. And then I did a bunch of freelance stuff, which was really fun with um, some of the big guys like ESPN and NBC. So I definitely have the start of where you guys are kind of starting at. And then I somehow ended up in LED front end control and commissioning sports stadium walls along with data and graphics, um, pixel mapping and all that fun stuff. So one thing to note about this industry is that you will somehow get to a fun job that you like. <laughs> it might not start out right away with exactly what you wanna do, but uh, either way, it always seems to kind of mold into something. So anyways, with B2B, I took all of that, um, that knowledge of my background, and now I am a, essentially a product specialist with how these work in flow with a design. We also have six other products that I support, and I'm going to walk through some of those just so that you have an idea. And what I like to say about our specific um, section of Sony is it's the bread and butter of the AV world. So think corporate, think conference rooms, think higher education, all the cameras and microphones that are in all of the rooms that you guys are in in the, your building. That is what, what our department handles. We have another department that handles um, broadcast media directly. So like those fun microphones with the domes, all the Sony cameras for the Super Bowl. That department is our media department. Then we have another one that handles just healthcare. And then we have another one that handles business development in general. And then just recently in our department, we got a few people uh, moved into a virtual production department and we are going headfirst into the virtual production pond with our uh, Crystal LED products and our big broadcast media camera, the Venice. And so that is now a new department as well. So you're talking to a business unit that's under a bunch of other umbrellas of Sony and the, the key uh, part is Sony Electronics. So if you ask me how you can get a PlayStation, I can't even get a PlayStation. <laughs> so that's a little bit about what I'm talking about today and where I do. So my day-to-day -day is supporting our uh, 12 account managers. So I literally just got off a call today right before this one, which was the account manager explaining our product line. And then they would ask me questions like, how do I mount the beamforming microphone? How far does this camera shoot? Um, how do you install the Crystal LED product? How large can you get, et cetera, et cetera. So those technical questions is where I thrive. And um, what I want to go ahead and talk about today, well, before I get into PTZ cameras, do you guys have any questions for me, either about Sony or about products that we have, um, or any kind of research you might have been doing earlier and you're like, I want to ask Sony person this? Anybody? No, nope, they've got nothing. Okay. Well, okay. if you do, Fire. reach out to Sam and I can hopefully, um, hopefully answer that for you. So PTZ and point of view cameras, what does that mean? So I'm going to talk as if you guys don't know about them. And if you're like, hey, stop talking, we already know about this. Just like, I don't know, tell me. <laughs> Do the wrap up signal for broadcast and then I'll know that I need to just stop talking. So this is uh, a point of view camera. It's called our XB25. And what point of view means is that it just shoots straight. There's no panning, there's no tilting. This one does have zoom. 
This one does not. And both of these, I call them brothers because they uh, basically this is just a, the little brother and this is the big brother. As you can see, they have tally light. Also, this XB25 has a digital optical zoom. This does just has a manual focus, no zoom. So this is a point and shoot essentially, and this is a point point of view, point and shoot, but with zoom. So why is that important? In the environments where these guys thrive is they're typically paired with a PTZ camera because the PTZ camera allows for that uh, pan tilt zoom. The other thing is we have a AI box called our edge analytics system that is usually put into education environments where um, it handles some, uh, five features called auto PTZ tracking, handwriting extraction, uh, chroma keyless CG overlay, focus area cropping and close up by gesture. This camera works best with three of those features because it doesn't, those features don't require pan tilt zoom. Are you guys familiar with the difference between optical zoom versus digital zoom? Okay, so the focus area cropping part handles just digital zoom and the auto PTZ tracking handles the reality of optical zoom with this guy. So we, we actually use the motors, this head actually turns and that opens up not only another single output for that focus area cropping, but this guy only does one. That guy gives a digital zoom. However, um, you have your 4K raster, you have your digital zoom that's you know pixeling around the, the thing. You do have that as secondary output, but you don't have the flexibility of going all the way around the room like this guy, because he's got like 350 something degrees of, of turn. So that, leads me to the, the key to figuring out what's going to be best for your client or as you're maybe the director of a show and you have to figure out your equipment that you're going to use for a show. Everything has its pros and cons and you just have to find the right piece of gear for what you're wanting to do. So you might be able to get away with using this guy. He's probably going to be a lot less expensive to rent uh, where you might, because you don't have a Zoom, you might need to move to this guy. This doesn't make this guy bad. It just means you need to plug in your, your proper piece of gear for whatever you need. So with that, it brings me to the PTZ auto or the PTZ camera. So um, these guys are pretty exciting to work with. They are very smooth. It's a couple of things you want to look for in PTZ cameras is their smoothness, which means when they're actually operating and when they're actually um, you, you, their motors are actually moving. Is it smooth and is it quiet? That's usually the first two things people ask about that. And then varying on our product lines depend on how far this camera can zoom. So our 120, our SRG X120, X means 4K optional, and then 120 means 12 uh, optical zoom. And then our SRG X400 is SRG X meaning 4K, 400 means 40 optical zoom. So depending on how large the space is that the camera needs to go into um, would depend on which camera to get. And the, re the question always is, well, is there a price difference? Well, of course there is, because to go further in that zoom, you need a bigger chip, right? So that's what the SRG X400 is. We also have another line that you're probably familiar yet with called the BRC X400. And can anybody give me an idea of what the difference is between the BRC X and the SRG X? Okay, go for it. Updated version for SDI instead of SDI. What did he say? Uh, updated version for SDI instead of NDI. Uh, very close, very close. A little bit simpler. And that is that this hole right here where there's nothing, the BRC has sync. This one does not. So think BRC broadcast because most of the time people want to sync with broadcast, where this one just just has a natural, um, you know, it doesn't have anything where I can sync the frames. It just, I you put them all together and you hope they work kind of thing. So if somebody has to have five cameras in a room and they want them all to be synced, then we say, oh, go ahead and get our BRC line and put in a black burst or something like that to keep them in line. Nine times out of 10, the situation is, like let's say a house of worship, which by the way, start learning your lingo because you can't say church in the in a professional environment. You have to say house of worship because houses of worship mean all kinds of things. Doesn't matter what they're worshiping, 
they need cameras, right? So house of worship is the vertical for any religious environment that has a big auditorium with somebody talking in the front. So let's say we go with three SRGXs for this. You know, I have my X400 in the way back and then maybe I'll have two 120s on the side. I'm gonna point, that means I have three automated cameras and I should, the real word is unmanned because they're high enough on the ceiling. So then I have my outputs coming back to my control room or my bird nest, whatever you wanna call it. And how do I see those, all of those signals right in front of me ready to produce a show? Cool thing about these cameras is I hope by now you guys know what PoE is and PoE plus. Cool, if you don't figure it out, PoE plus and PoE involves sending power through the network connection. And also, you wanna look up something called Cables to Go, Legrand. They have a fantastic uh, environment of um, learning different protocols for cables. So. PoE, PoE plus, cat five, cat six, cat seven. How much power can you get through that different connection versus how much your camera is asking for versus how much your switch can actually output. So if you have these guys connected to a PoE switch that does not produce enough power for the camera, then your camera is gonna start acting funny. Or if you have a PoE switch that has enough network ports that has enough power for one camera, but you have three cameras connected to that PoE switch, then your cameras might start acting funny. So everybody understands a little bit about the capacity of different category cables and how much power and how much data they can send. This guy definitely is um, interested in getting full, as much power as it needs. You, you don't wanna skimp out. Usually you want to plan for 20% more power than what the, what the device is actually calling for. So, um, as far as the other things that come out of the back of this camera, uh, there is Visca RS422, which is some clients preferred form of control. Otherwise people utilize the LAN connection pretty, I would say 80% of my customers use the control out of the uh, network connection. So that goes into a device typically, this is a small version. This is uh, an RMIP10. You'll see the little uh, Phoenix connections back there. So power, control, then my network connection if I wanna use that. So what basically this means is this is plugged into a network switch. These are plugged into a network switch. I configure this either using the buttons or the web GUI. Every Sony product you'll ever come across has a web GUI. It doesn't matter what the spec sheets say. They are fantastic. They're helping, they help get the do job done quickly and this allows me the option to do, which I'm sure you guys all understand, switches, right? We have the camera feeds and then we have the macros and then we have the ability to manually adjust. Yeah, good. Okay, so same thing with this. What this does not do is switch. Okay, so this does not do a program out like your typical video switch. You know those big ass Grass Valley ones that sit in a TV truck that have the back panel is this big? with all of the inputs from the camera. That's not what this does. This just controls. So if you're wanting to send your outputs of your cameras somewhere to do a switch, that's another element that you wanna plan for this. Does that make sense? A lot of times people think this guy is gonna go into this and I'm gonna get one output out of a program out on a, you know, a clean feed off of an HDMI or an SDI. That's not how that works. Um, we did used to have a little baby, which I don't know, Sam, if you still have it. It's, it was the, um, I think it was like the MCX 500 or something, or it was a little black, um, switcher like this big and it had a couple ports, I think four in and it, it worked really nice. I think media just dis uh, discontinued it, but those that still have one love them. And I'm hoping that they're going to develop something as a replacement because what would be great is if we could have even just a small switcher that does all the work so that customers don't have to go with the two options. Now, something that you're probably familiar with at this point in the game, especially coming into the industry at this era, is um, you don't have to have this tactile control. You don't have to have buttons. You don't have to have the joystick. 
it's really just up to your customer. If you learn and find out that your operator is somebody that wants to touch buttons, then go ahead and, and consider this into your spec sheet. However, you can do all of the control that you need to with this guy over the network or over the web GUI, which is very helpful, especially for troubleshooting. So if you go into a situation, let's switch gears here and pretend that you are the engineer in command and you know, you're know you supposed to know how every product in your truck works, um, what, what can you know and always rely on with the Sony products? One is now that you have the connection with our Sony team, like you'll definitely be able to have some type of connection with either our pro support or somebody who still works in the department able to say, hey, I'm trying to commission this Sony camera, can you help me? That's always like backup number 10. The first thing you do in troubleshooting is open up the web GUI. Always have an engineer computer. I don't care who tells you what, have a Mac and have a PC, always. When you come into site and you plug it in and you say, I just need to see what's going on with this camera. That's the first step. And for Sony, that's opening up the web GUI. Figure out the, do your IP scan, figure out your network, get on your LAN, and just open this guy up and see what happens. 90% of the time, the issue that you're going to have is probably with the control system. We're dealing with, I have a, a few support call tickets open right now where every now and then the camera will just start, it's it's focusing, and then it all of a sudden just goes like, beee, like on its own. Well, it only happens after a certain preset is is clicked. So it'll the preset will get clicked and then the camera will be will go to its spot and then it'll be like beep. What is that? Is that us? How do we sort that out? Well, troubleshooting there there's usually a whole you could I could teach a whole class on troubleshooting, but one thing to remember is to first isolate see if the camera is actually having issue. We got in there with pro support, found out the camera's not having issue. They actually have some kind of bandwidth issue with their control system where it sends the packets for the preset and then it trails, it doesn't close the, the contact loop. It just like still sends a bit more information. And so the camera's like, do I listen to that or not? So that's on their end. And that's something that they have to sort out with their control system. Um, going back to the POV cameras real quick is, um, you know, obviously a much more simpler uh, design as far as, you know, network in, power in if I'm not using PoE, HDMI out, there's also Visca. But something I wanted to bring up real quick before we pause is the audio in and the audio out. I feel like there's an age old debate of whether or not audio and video in a design should always be separate or you should try to um, connect them. These are, these are not, they have them, but they're not designed to take in audio and, and embed them into the HDMI and output them together on a like large scale. That's, if you're going past like 50 cameras in a, in a site, I would even say 20, break up your audio and video. Like give the, give the audio a chance to be great. Give the video a chance to be great and don't try to merge them. In, a, in in conversation where it's like 20 or less and you're in a remote environment with like a big classroom, you can probably get away with it. Um, so what do I mean by that? If I had this guy, he's got an audio in and an audio out. If I had this guy, I have a microphone somewhere around him connected into the back. I can choose to embed in the HDMI or I can choose to output on the audio out and it's going through here, syncing with the video, and then going out to wherever it's going to go. Fine. Or I could just have my camera and then my microphone being sent into something like OBS or one of the other uh, networking applications and say, I just want these two devices to be my final program out to, say, like a Teams call or something. Um, same thing with this guy. He also has audio in and audio out. I should say he actually has audio in, so the only way to get audio out of this guy is through the HDMI embed. And we all know with embedding and disembedding that that opens up the possibility for what? Tell me. If we're jerking around with audio signals, what could it be giving us? The uh, quiet 
You can hear me, but my mouth is moving differently. <laughs> so lag, right? If I'm sending audio through a bunch of stop gaps, like this camera, it's adding lag. Right now, I don't have, I don't even know how my lag is right now. Is it, is it spot on with this microphone? Okay, cool. I have another scenario here where an engineer computer is behind me where I set up my beamforming microphone to do a demo. I use that, but I, but I output to a separate Teams call here because I want, I don't want to send this microphone to this computer and then to this computer because then my lag is going to be a couple milliseconds off as well. Another great example of understanding the difference and my argument towards separating video and audio. Buzzer at a basketball game. Visually, on camera, on TV, we see the basketball go in the hoop. But then how many milliseconds in reality, in the actual bowl or stadium, do we see the light go off around the basketball versus we hear it in the stadium and then when we hear it in our TV in our living room. So back when I was doing stadium installs, there was an eight second or eight millisecond delay in court. No matter how well we tweaked the system, there was a, still an eight millisecond delay. And that that is enough to like piss off an entire stadium full of fans because they see the light, the ball goes in, they hear the sound. That all needs to happen at the same time. So how do we how do we plan and puzzle piece together the capture rate of all of these devices, the audio capture, all the stop gaps that we have to get to to give our program out of in stadium, in truck, and at home. So lots of really cool ways to think. And here's the fun part, and then I'll stop talking. Um, in this industry, that signal flow that I just said, there are niches in all of that. So you can decide that you're going to be the camera guy, or you're going to be the the bandwidth guy, or you're going to be the audio guy, or you're going to be the, the, the engineering command and the truck guy. Like there's so many cool spots to go and be in that um, signal flow. That's where you want to think. What technology is getting you excited that you kind of see like, I would want to be that guy that makes sure the basketball and the light goes off at the same time. Or I would want to be the guy that makes sure the camera can always move properly, et cetera. Mine, my niche is video signal follow through. So I'm a big nerd when it comes to event going on, cameras capturing it. How do I get it to the end, the far end, which is at you know my grandma's TV in her living room? All right, I'm gonna stop because that was a lot of information. And then we'll move on to the product uh, specs. Any questions so far or thoughts that you have about anything that I've said? Anything guys? Nope, they're all good. <laughs> I know a lot of information, right? <laughs> um, OK, let me go ahead and share with you a little bit about uh, our product line. And I'm actually going to go ahead and just open up our regular Sony website first, because that is really a more public facing introduction anyways. So give me a thumbs up when you see my screen. Woohoo. Okay, so I have like a 0.8 delay. <laughs> okay, so this is our Sony professional website, so pro.sony. Um, in here is where you will find all of our business units. So audio, archiving and content management, medical imaging, our B, uh, B, B2B and media kind of share these four here. So what I mean by that is studio and broadcast and digital cinema is one department, that's media. Camcorders and PTZ remote is shared between media and B2B. Broadcast and production, professional monitors, and that's us, meaning like, this, well, let me start over. This is all media here. Anything you find in this category is our media department. Professional projectors here, that's all B2B. You're not going to find many projectors being sold in broadcast trucks. <laughs> um, professional displays, 
displays, LED walls, and the software to run it. That's also B2B. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with our Bravia, our Pro Bravia displays. And to be honest, this kind of bored me when I first started at this job because I just came from LED and signal processing and technical instruction. So why do I care about a, a I'm going to use a bad word, TV? In Pro AV, do not use the word TV. You go to Best Buy and use that term. This is a display. And the reason why there is a huge distinction between that is because your Best Buy TVs are consumer products. They are built to last a certain amount of time. They do not care so much about um, color correct reproduction. So these professional displays get color calibrated, which means if I see, I don't know the name of that guy in the back with the pink shirt, but your pink on my ViewSonic monitor is somewhat pink. And if that's actually a red shirt, then my ViewSonic uh, monitor is really blowing out your pink red shirt. But if I had your pink red shirt on my Bravia, I would want to make sure the color of your shirt in real life is actually the color that's on my display. So that's a big, that's a big change. Look at, he's like, who the fuck is she talking about? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Pro Bravia displays, uh, another big thing that makes displays professional is 50 inch, 43 inch, 32 inch, lots of size ranges. Size ranges are a big deal when you're dealing with conference rooms. You're also, also a big deal when you're dealing with video displays or uh, arrays, meaning I'm going to put slap five, fit two, four 55 inch displays together, and that's a video array, the cheap version of a direct view LED custom installation. So color reproduction, size. Also, right now you could go home with your TV, use your remote, and turn up and down your volume, right? or you have media players of some sort, like a Roku or an Apple TV going into your HDMIs. These professional displays have something called Pro Mode, which is a way to treat. You guys know what I mean by treat? Some of you probably do, yeah. Treatment is when you have a show or you have a general idea of a, um, program out and you treat it with something like graphics or color correction or something. So it's now a dirty signal because it has stuff on the screen like graphics, it got color treated, et cetera, versus a clean feed. So I'm gonna treat my display and say, I only want my volume to go a certain level. So Joe Schmo in the dentist's office can't go and turn it on. I only want Teams or Zoom to be my, my active signal. I wanna turn off all of my HDMI terminals and you can treat your display. So if every single one of you bought a professional Bravia 55 inch, you could treat it differently to where dude in the front and blue shirt can have a PlayStation being your primary signal, where a guy with the beard in the middle can say, I want HDMI 2 to always be my primary signal, right? So that's, that's the huge picture that you get once you buy a professional display. Last but not least, well, two things. One is 24-7 operation versus 16-8 or 16-9 operation, or I don't know what consumer displays have. Like, I haven't been in Best Buy in years, so I don't know. But if I go and I leave my TV on over the weekend, am I going to have a burn-in spot on Monday? I don't know. These guys are designed to be able to run 24-7 for whatever reason, whether it's a dentist office flipping through information, whether it's a broadcast truck, that has the show agenda on the right on the inside, et cetera, et cetera. Last but not least is something I, I hate talking about, but I have to tell you because I want to be transparent, is just as much as you are in any, any industry, there's these awesome technical specs and then there's always some kind of sales incentive. So the sales incentive with these is that their warranty is, is extended past the ones that you would buy at Best Buy. So these are three to five year, a re replacement depending on the warranty that's bought. Uh, the warranty is usually always bought with these. And then also we have something called advanced replacement. So if you're Capital One and you buy 65 displays and 30 of them decided to, HDMI terminal decided to take a crap and stop working, 
we send you 30 displays before we even dive into what the issue is. So that's a professional kind of sales incentive that goes on um, when you when you move in from consumer technology to professional technology. Any questions about the Bravias before I move to a different product? What's the smallest dimension that you guys have of those? What's the smallest? 32. So to answer your other question, I can only see your knee, whoever you're, you are. But um, <laughs> there you are. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 32 inch. Keep in mind, you said smallest, right? This is B to B. So this is going to be this. This is going to be like this is going to be like a hotel conference room confidence display. This is going to be like a dentist office, something like that. The broadcast media department they have all of those super high end professional confidence monitors that you'd slap on a video camera. They also have like you guys are probably familiar with Marshall, those confidence. So those that that is a product line that is different from this because these are displayed big ass displays that you put on a wall, where broadcast media is gonna have ones all the way down. To, I think five inches their smallest one. So that I just wanted to make that distinction before I moved on. How's their cost compared to television typically? Oh, you used a bad word. Um. Let's see. I have no idea how to answer that question, actually, because I don't know their price book. Um, I can find out for you. I know they're different. They're not that much. They're you're talking like maybe two, three hundred bucks different when you buy them through a typical supplier. So I buy a lot of them. Between broadcast media and broadcast. OK, I'll find out. So second product laser projectors versus lamp projectors i'm not going to bore you with these because i feel like you guys don't really care if you want to care more about this i by all means i'm ready for you we have two specific lines one we don't even sell lamp anymore that's that's dead and gone laser is the shiznit now if you're going to do projection do laser um 131 is our highest at 13 lumens can somebody tell me what a lumen is You're saying a measurement of light. Perfect. Definitely uh, get more comfortable with what that means and how you can manipulate it and why you would need different lumens per um, space because you'll be you're going to be using that a lot. Even if you're okay, if you're going to be an audio technician, maybe you don't have to care so much. But if you're going to be anything in video, you're going to want to care. So 13,000 all the way down to 5,000. And then we have these big kahunas. They are GTZ 380 and 280. These are the ones that are like half the size of a car and go into like planetariums and um, 3D, huge, beautiful places. They are now actually no longer the size of a car. The one on the left is about 200 pounds and it's about two and a half feet by one feet high. And um, I know I can't lift it by myself. The lens itself is about five-ish, 10 pounds. And then the 280 is just a smaller lumen. So I want you guys to look at this conversation here because this is should look familiar to you in broadcast. 10,000 lumens, we already talked about that. True 4K resolution, there's a difference between consumer 4K and professional 4K. Extreme 16,000 to 1 contrast and DCI P3. So you want to write out, write down all those words and go figure out what they mean because they will be very important to you moving forward. Contrast and brightness is really the really the, the core physics that we deal with in this industry. Um, so yeah, projectors are pretty awesome, definitely in more for our B2B line than broadcast media, but um, worth bringing up because we do sell a lot of them. All right, any questions about projectors before we move on? That beard guy's like, she's done talking yet. <laughs> All right. So the fun stuff. I don't have too many cool pictures for you yet because a lot of the installations that we just did were still under NDA. But 
This is our crystal LED product. Has any of you seen LED product up close before? Cool. One, two, three. Um, I don't have a module anymore. I had to send them back. Oh, I have an old module from a million years ago. Hold on. But you guys, you guys have an LED lab, though. Isn't that blank lab have a video blown in or no? They're projectors. Are they putting a video wall in somewhere? Jason said he was installing a video wall somewhere. Yeah. Jason's always installing a wall somewhere. Jason doesn't really tell us what he's doing a lot. He just kind of does things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. We have a Jason too that builds walls, so I was like, Jason's always building a wall. <laughs> okay, this is a very old, I mean like 12 years old, tile. So we're seeing pixels. We see a massive pixel pitch. Let me know what pixel pitch is. <laughs> Look at. I'm, I'm laughing at Beard Guy's face because he's like, no. Um, pixel pitch is the different bit, distance between each diode. So here's pixel, space between it, another diode. The space between that is the starting specification of direct view LED. Direct view LED and resolution and aspect ratio all play together. So if I have a pixel pitch, this is probably a pixel pitch of um, 20. This is 12 years old. This was on top of some stadium scoreboard. Um, far, far, far away from the first eyeball. This is technically just considered LED versus direct view LED. Imagine these diodes so close together that it's they're a millimeter apart. That means that I can walk up to it and not see the pixels, right? Our product, 1.2 pixel pitch, I can walk up six feet away from the display and I still can't make out a pixel. That is incredible. So if you ever get to Infocom or see videos of Infocom, check out 2019 Sony Crystal LED, and you'll see some of the beauty, probably start drooling as I do, um, of what it means to create a custom sized direct view LED wall with our product, which is 1.2 or 1.5 pixel pitch. And as you can imagine with LED, um, the size can be anything you could possibly imagine. I mean, a 55 inch, I think a cabinet, so a cabinet full of these is like two feet by one feet tall. So imagine having 550 cabinets. Now you have a Times Square wall. So anything in between that or the LED balls that, are, that they do are wrapped around buildings and then they create the content to look like a fishbowl. Um, really amazing stuff. Virtual production, direct view LED like Mandalorian. They had an LED, direct view LED behind as the set. They used Unreal Engine and Epic Games to create the virtual set, drop the actor right in the middle, and then the camera and the using camera traction capabilities would move around the set with the actor and the LED, the content on the LED would move around with the actor as well. For that type of environment, you have to have a fine pixel pitch, meaning anything sub four. Some would argue with me and say it's sub two, meaning sub two pixel pitch, um, but that's here nor there. So when you get, if you ever, get in to time, sorry, have time to review our website, go to one of our high contrast micro LED module, go down to resources, and there is a somewhere, well, there should be, if not, I'll just send Sam the link. There should be a link for the crystal LED configurator, and you can play around with fun sizes about what um, you know, how big can you make a crystal LED wall? How many cabinets would you need to make that happen, etc. And this is some of the behind the scenes work that gets done for when you're considering the size of an LED wall. 
Sam, how am I on time? Uh, yep, you're doing good. You got about 15 minutes left. Did you say 15? Yeah, 15, yes. Cool. Before questions or including questions? Uh, that's to basically the end of our class. Oh, fun. <gasps> Yay. This is awesome. OK. So uh, going back to the specifications, here's that funny word, pixel pitch, 1.2 millimeter. Um, remember I told you what are the two things that uh, are the base physics of our industry, brightness and contrast? So our surface is deep black coating, which means that the diodes are sitting on a matte black surface instead of sitting on a metallic surface. So if you have a metallic surface, more light's going to bounce around rather than be targeted to go out, out straight out of the diode into our eyeballs. Um, this doesn't totally matter because we are custom building the wall, right? So this is just the size of one cabinet. Brightness is, again, those lumens that we're talking about. So lumens and nits, candle is per squared meter, inverse square law. Learn that now so that you're not me at 30 learning inverse square law and then having to teach it for six years. <laughs> Just learn it now. So inverse square law brightness, um, we are at 800 uh, on our contrast model. Our brightness model is 1800. So what do you think would be the reason behind having a brighter display? in LED. Can you think of what that why that would be important? They said use at night. Okay. Any other thoughts? HDR high dynamic range you're saying. Yep. Very good. Those are definitely two big ones. Keep in mind at night, um, you typically want a lesser bright because our eyeballs, I don't know if you guys ever try this at home, oh, turn off all the light in your room, have your phone showing you a movie, and then just flip on your flashlight and light up the background and see how much your eyes relax. Because now your, your depth of focus and your um, peripherals have now created a space that's easier for your eye wrist to accept light. So same thing in nighttime, if you have an 800 nit display, that's going to be plenty bright. If you have an 1800 nit display, you're going to be like, your eyes are going to be crying because they'll be like on fire. Try that little exercise when you get home and you'll see what I mean. Also, you meant HDR. Yes, definitely. Virtual production, brightness of the display, you have TV lights hitting that display, so you have what's called ambient light hitting a light-omitting surface. So light's going this way, light's going this way. Guess what happens when that happens? Cancels the color. So you have to have a balance between the ambient light that's happening and around. Like there's ambient light right now because I have a window open. And then if I had this display on or that display on, that's admitting light and I need to adjust that for a correct reception of color. Um, one last thing, and then I'll stop talking, is I could probably sit for a long, long time talking about color theory. Very beautiful thing. You're going to see it throughout the industry in a lot of ways. One thing that I love about our industry is that we thrive and are measured on the ability to produce accurate color. If you are any bit a visual learner, this is probably going to make more sense to you than, um, than if you maybe are an audible learner, because I maybe don't speak as clearly about color theory than I do showing it on a whiteboard. So my apologies. But something about color theory is 
that. Um, our eyeballs can only see a certain frequency of light. And in that base theory, our displays and our cameras can also only produce or capture um, certain frequencies of color. So I'm going to leave you with that thought while you um, kind of take away some of the things that I mentioned and chew on. Um, as far as your, my visual learners in the class, this is an example of color frequency, just a little sliver of it from the sphere of color. And this might not, this might look totally foreign to you, and I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by looking at it because it, it takes some people their entire career to fully understand it. The biggest takeaway is if you change and adjust value of color, hue, and chroma at the same speed, that's when you really see the difference in color saturation and more. So um, definitely really fun. If I was doing something other than specifying gear and camera flow and all that fun stuff, um, I would probably be working with these guys that do only color. <laughs>